as we're live, and hopefully we will stay that way. Yesterday, we stayed live, and when the State House uh, internet went down, um, everybody but Faith eventually got, got on, including the, the witnesses. So we continued, but hopefully um, we will stay live today. Um, today, we wanted to talk about, we know how many houses we've strung lines by. So how many houses have access? What we don't seem to know is how many houses have signed up. We know there were a lot of affordability and incentive programs put out by carriers. Um, we know they had some deadlines and you know limited time frames. I've heard there have been some price increases. Um, so we're trying to get an idea of how many people initially signed up, how many people used, you know, the, the, I guess the impact of affordability programs and then how many people are presently signed up and the status of those programs um, just to get a sense as to what did we really accomplish and is that subsidy um, how crucial is that because I'm going to assume people didn't sign off with their kids going to school and they're going to work online unless affordability was a real issue so um, we will, uh, that's what we want to talk about today. And I'm going to start with Commissioner Tierney. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. It's always a pleasure to be here. Good afternoon. Uh, I know you have many people presenting today, so perhaps you could give me a sense of how much time um, you'd like the department to, to save you. Um, um, I think just a short, very short intro what what you know how many how many houses do you know we have put access on the road by their house fair enough what don't so, we know so what we've done today is prepared uh, two presentations and given slides to faith they'll be available to the committee and online as well and i think in the interest of time we won't go through um, all of those slides one presentation is about the Consumer Affairs and Public Information Division that may be of interest to the committee in due course to see what the complaint rate has been about broadband and the like during the pandemic and the work that the department does in that area, notwithstanding that we don't have jurisdiction to regulate. The second presentation is about the affordability issue and there are about seven slides in it. The last two are the ones that I think are probably most germane to what you were just talking about, um, Chair Cummings. I'm gonna ask uh, Clay to go through uh, that presentation if that is what you'd like. Otherwise, I can just cut to slides six and seven that tell you how many applicants we had in our subsidy program, how much money was awarded and what the average award was. Um, in terms of how many houses the service was made available to, I'm gonna ask Clay if he can answer that question off the top of his head. Committee, what would you like to hear? Can, can Clay just tell us a number for houses? I'm sorry, for, for houses to which we brought a, a broadband subsidy? To, no, to uh, which, no uh, houses that we ran available. a line by. Um, we, we brought internet service through the connectivity initiative. Um, I'm, I'm gonna estimate, because I don't remember the exact number, but uh, uh, nearly 10,000 homes. Um, the um, Lee Cap program, the, the consumer uh, line extension program did another 260 homes. And that program, we know the people signed up and purchased service through that program. Okay, yeah. And so then, no, uh, to your, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, go ahead. No, that's fine. I was just gonna say, and I think it's important to put a flag in this, the questions that the committee is now asking is how many people did we actually connect? 
which is very different from the, the mission that we were pursuing in the heat of uh, the emergency last year, which was how many folks can we make it available to since the measure has been against the 70,000 addresses that had little or no access, that was the reference point. And in reference to that 70,000, what Clay just gave you is a 10,000 10, reduction. So we're now down to 60,000 have little or no access. The more granular question of how many of those have actually been um, hooked up is, is a different question on which the department does not have uh, complete data, as you just heard from Clay, we do know that folks who asked for line extensions through the LECAP program, in fact, got connected. The other, in part, also has to await uh, the, the door knock, not the door knock, but the mailer that we're going to be sending out, letting folks know that this service is now newly available. And I think folks who are here today will be in a better position to tell you how many people they actually connected. In terms of the subsidy, just to give you a sense of availability, and what people have, have uh, done with the program during the pandemic. Uh, Clay, I'm just gonna handle slide six and seven. We had 2,935 applicants during the um, period of uh, July 1 to I think uh, mid-December. We awarded $920,712 and the average award was about $313. And to your point, Chair Cummings, um, the federal government has very recently made uh, money available to the FCC for a lifeline style subsidy program for broadband, that is going to be uh, low income um, based. So they're going to be putting more strictures on that benefit than were imposed when we did the subsidy program through our CRF offering here in Vermont. So my, my sense is that there'll be a smaller pool of folks who are going to be able to draw down that benefit in Vermont which then raises the question of whether the state wishes to continue a benefit that would reach people who perhaps don't meet the low income parameter, but who nonetheless are in need of a subsidy to take service, at least during the pandemic. Um, and very broad brush strokes, the federal emergency broadband benefit is $3.2 billion in funding, that's national. It's going to be administered by the FCC um, the subsidy is supposed to be available in March, and I think uh, Senator Sorotkin has been doing some work in trying to close the gap in January and February until this benefit's available. Uh, the department filed comments in conjunction with the PUC on this program on January 25, and we have a set of reply comments going in as well. And we really don't know too much more about the program, except that it looks like there will be a credit of up to $50 a month. Um, and there'll be $100 toward a connected device. And we think it's going to last between eight and nine months, the program. Okay, so not ongoing. So again, we've got a cliff. There, there the is, there yeah. is. Although I recall having this conversation with the committee uh, last summer when we were working through what to do with the CRF money and, and Senator Pearson and I had an exchange at one point about um, do, do you make the money available to build infrastructure or do you make the money available to provide a benefit? And where we sort of landed was with this money through these programs, the thing to do largely is to build the infrastructure because there are many other avenues by which you can get at the equipment or the uh, subsidy uh, element, such as for instance, this, uh, this federal program that's just come available. Uh, E-rate is another source that's for in the education realm, where quite a bit of money is being newly made available as well, where students can get help with, um, with equipment and subscriptions. But those, those details remain to be fleshed out as well. And, and more importantly, perhaps that money is being pushed out through existing mechanisms that the federal government has uh, designed and that the states have, um, have also participated in designing. It varies by state to state. And so those are, those are programs that the department generally knows about, but the department isn't actually involved in shaping those programs or regulating them. But to the, the point about the conversation with Senator Pearson, that's an example of where other help is available to make sure that the people who need this service are able to get the necessary equipment and, and the subscription. And so the department's been focused on deploying infrastructure. That's all I plan to say about uh, these topics, because I really think it's important for you to hear from the ISPs that you've invited here today. But if you have anything at this time for me, happy to take the question. Any questions at this point? Okay, I 
think that's just a good refresher for us. Um, I've got Roger Nishi next, Waitsville Champlain Valley Telecom and independent, you're also representing independent telephone companies. So welcome back. It's been a little while. Uh, glad to be here today. Uh, we've actually set this up to have Kim go first and then I'll follow. Okay. So if she could start, that would be greatly appreciated. That's fine. Yep. And where is Kim? I'm right here. There you are. You're moving. Okay. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. Uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. Yes. Okay. I want to thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Kimberly Gates, and I am the controller of Franklin Telephone Company, a small independent company in northern Vermont. And my company is one of the independent telephone companies serving Vermont's telephone and broadband needs. And um, you should have received a handout that's been circulated. Um, you sent it in. It is on, uh, on the internet under documents for today. So the committee okay. should be able to call that up. Okay. And I'm just going to touch on it briefly, but I want you to know that it's there. So that it gives you a, a brief summary to look at. Um, so the independents are Franklin, Telephone, Shoreham, TDS, Topsum, Vtel, and Waitsfield Champlain Valley Telecom. And uh, we are experienced providers with the ability to continue to build out broadband and telephone service to all our customers. Um, we have the expertise to design, build, operate, manage, and maintain our networks. Um, and we've been doing it, most of us have been doing it for 100 years. Uh, the broadband's been about 20 years. And we serve rural high cost areas. Um, we have a carrier of last resort obligation, which means we have to build to all, all customers in our service area. That's our obligation, even with competition and high cost and we have to have affordable rates. And we're building broadband now. Um, so a little bit about Franklin Telephone. Um, it was started in the 1890s by my great grandfather. And as a small Vermont family owned and operated business, um, I get to wear many hats. I do a little bit of everything from accounting, customer service, legislative and regulatory, engineering, construction, tech support, Sure, there's a few other things I forgot, but I pretty much do a little bit of everything. Um, I'm not very good at fiber splicing, but I know how it's done. Um, we started our fiber to the home in 2014, and uh, we started it on the dirt roads. And it's it's not a business model that is normal or should be followed, uh, but we did it, did it to exceed our customers' needs. Uh, we had some copper plant that was causing us a lot of headaches and our customers a lot of headaches. And so we opted to start replacing those plants um, with fiber. Um, and, and it's been a big learning curve. Um, the customers appreciate the fiber, uh, but they don't want to pay for the higher bandwidth packages. Um, and um, it, it's disappointing. Um, and fiber the home is expensive. So just for my company, for our fiber customers, 20% take the same package that they can get on copper, the 10-1 package, and they pay no more a month. We don't charge any installation and they're taking what they already had. The higher package, uh, I only have 13% of our customers taking a higher package. So without increasing our revenues, but increasing our expenses for the fiber build, um, it's harder to keep the broadband needs met and to keep it affordable. So last March, when the pandemic was declared, um, we went to work. We started running fiber. Um, I remember several days being out there when it's snowing, trying to run fiber off the reel. So my husband and cousin ran 40,000 feet of fiber last year. And uh, my daughter is home from college studying uh, and I got to be the flaggers and the gophers. So it was, and that was in addition to our normal operations of running our network. So it was a, it was quite a year last year. Um, we were fortunate and we appreciate that we received a Get Vermonters Connected new initiative grant 
Um, that grant was for 23,000 feet of fiber connecting 24 locations. So just to do the math, because I like math, that's six homes per mile. That's two, over $2,000 per customer. Um, and with the grant money, Franklin didn't apply for 100% funding. We, we put in some of our money with that grant as well. Um, but at, at $2,000 per customer, if a customer were to pay $11 more a month, it takes 15 years to just cover the construction cost without anything going towards the cost of maintenance and maintaining the operations. So it's a, numbers don't always make me happy. Um, Topsom and Waitsfield also received grants for the fiber to home build and their numbers are, are in the handout that's available. Uh, VTEL is 100% fiber to the home. TDS and Shoreham were installing remotes to improve their network and their broadband. And so remotes, um, we don't get talked about that often, um, but you get a pretty good bang for your buck uh, for increasing bandwidth um, at a, a more reasonable cost than fiber to the home for each house. Uh, the timing for the grants last year was really challenging. It was a short turnaround for applying and to have construction complete. Um, and if you didn't have supplies or know a really good salesperson, you weren't getting supplies in time. Last year was, was critical. The fiber, um, getting fiber and supplies was really challenging. Even this year, fiber that I ordered in November is due in June. So um, we deal with a lot, um, but we're building. We keep building. Um, it's about keeping our customers and our community uh, connected and we try really hard. Looking at this year's construction projects, um, I was working on it and I got discouraged because <laughs> it's, it's really hard to justify, um, you know, I'm down to projects that are like a mile and a half, five customers, half a mile, one customer, third of the mile, one customer. Um, it, it's, it's really hard to, to do the calculation to keep it affordable. And if people aren't taking the higher take rates, um, there's not the revenue to offset the, the increased expenses. Um, but I'm still building, um, just like all the other independents. It's, it's, a, it's a tough battle, but we're still building. Um, so a couple takeaways is fiber to the home is, is a great technology, but it's, it's expensive. Um, and the revenues are not offsetting the builds. Um, Franklin, Shoreham, TDS, Topsom, VTEL, and Waitsfield, we're building and maintaining networks now, trying to reach all our customers. That's our obligation. And we're, we're best positioned to build out. Uh, we're balancing that carrier of last resort obligation. We have competition and we're trying to maintain affordability. So I'm gonna let Roger Pick up from I here. think uh, Sandra Pearson has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Tim, are, when you talk about building, are you, I'm kind of assuming you're going by, uh, you're, you're replacing or, or stringing right next to current maybe cable or whatever that you own. Is that accurate? Um, we overlash copper cable typically. Uh, but that's already yours. In other words, the, the, as you're saying, it's expensive. I, I can appreciate that. What we had heard is if you're, if it's blank, you know, stringing fiber versus stringing a different technology is not all that different in costs. So I'm just trying to, I'm trying to understand how, uh, what I'm misunderstanding here. And can you repeat the question for me? Well, so if, if you're just were in the wilderness where there was nothing and you were stringing fiber, it would cost you a dollar. And if you were stringing copper or cable, it would cost you 90 cents. I'm just making that up, but, it, but it's not wildly different, but you're talking about it being quite expensive. And so is that because you're replacing your older infrastructure or you're overlapping your, your current infrastructure? 
Um, yes, and it's um, well, it's a, it's a combination of things. So when you when you build a plant, uh, counting wise, you plan on a thirty year life for poles and for cable and stuff. Uh, so I have copper that is not thirty years old, that's not fully depreciated, that I have to put in. The other expense is the individual customer location. Uh, the equipment, uh, it's called an ONT, optical network terminal, uh, that box that gets put in the house. There's a cost to that. Uh, typically, uh, the majority of our cases, the customer has older inside wiring where we have to assist them with getting ethernet cables to the new location. So there's the time and cost of running that. Um, the, it, it just all adds up. Uh, you know, if it was a new build, yeah, I just put fiber in and it's not a big deal, but these aren't, aren't new builds. And then when you're doing drops to the homes, that is fiber as well, or are you combining? Yes. Okay. I remember I, I'm here in Burlington. I, I was the first Burlington telecom customer north of Pearl street, um, just by virtue of where I live. And I remember trying to help in the troubled early days and they said, well, uh, and we sort of had a campaign plan to go door to door and get more customers. And management said, you got to understand it's 500 bucks a house. It's not that we kind of don't want more customers because it's a cash flow problem. So I, I appreciate this is a tricky issue. And, and oftentimes it may sound like we're simplifying it in the way we talk about it. But I do think we appreciate some of the nuances, but it's very helpful to have your examples. Thanks. And, and it makes a difference if it's an aerial drop versus a buried drop. Uh, traditionally, our copper drops were direct buried. Um, we now ask that they be in a conduit for a fiber because if, if somebody uh, weed wax a copper drop um, or they dig it up planting a tree, you know, there's a little, it's called a hockey puck. You just make the connection, seal it inside this little hockey puck with, with gel and you're good to go with fiber, it's glass. It's like taking two strands of hair, melting them together, keeping them straight. So you have to have the conduit because typically you're pulling in a new new fiber. You're not going to be splicing that. Um, so there's an, you know, anybody with a buried surface, there's that added, added fee. Sandra Sorotkin. Um, so I'm trying to uh, get at a basic question. I understand that the pandemic has increased need for broadband. Um, but is there any, can you explain to us um, what other impacts that has had on your business? Um, other than increased demand, is, did it make uh, companies like yourself more difficult to survive? Um, function differently, or I guess that's the question. Well, I think everybody's functioned differently in this last year. So, um, it you know, it's more challenging with, um, with COVID being able to go into houses or not going into houses. So that slowed things down. Um, the the big challenge is the supply of material um you know we we ran out of fiber drop and you know i had to go through all sorts of sources and and um you know it was was fortunate to find some or you know we get all ready to do a job and there's one piece missing uh you know i waited you know now the fiber world typically you go to order something it's a it's a four to six week wait that was pre-COVID. Now, when you order something, it's a six-month wait. Uh, so you readjust. Um, you know, I I ordered. I had to figure everything out last October. What I'm going to do this year, just to know that I have supplies in route. Um, so, um, did you qualify for any PP loans or economic recovery grants in the state of Vermont? I did not apply for any. Uh, my my revenues uh, were were consistent with the year before. I have a small staff um, that we you know we were able to maintain everybody's position. Actually, I think we all worked harder than we've ever had before. Um, but I didn't apply for any of those programs. Thank you. 
Kim, can I add two, two things? What, well, Roger? Well, I, I can just add to a few things. I, I, I don't know a lot of companies that applied for the PPE and it really, the, the COVID was an environment when, where there's really an increased demand for our services. So we had additional customers hooking up with their broadband connections and, and many customers increasing the amount of, of bandwidth that they purchased from us. So they upgraded their service to a higher speed package. And therefore um, we, we did um, keep revenues fairly constant. Uh, so so that, that was part of um, an outcome of, of, of COVID. Uh, one thing that um, I can add is that we spent a lot of time in customers' homes and working them through um, various issues that impacted the, the level of speeds they were purchasing. In an old, in an old environment, everyone, where everyone hooked up directly with a wire, uh, we could guarantee speeds into the home. But now with Wi-Fi, uh, there are so many uh, factors that come into play with the, um, it, that impacts the speed a customer can receive. Uh, whether it be the amount of, of units they have attached, which everyone always underestimates, um, to where the, their modems are located. Uh, I always use the example of, we have customers who uh, they put their modem in, I'll, I'll say in the basement. Well, when you go into the basement, if you have your light on upstairs and, and expect to see in the basement, you won't see anything. So if your modem's in the basement and you're in, in on the second floor upstairs, uh, you shouldn't expect to have good coverage or good speeds because it, you, there's no, there, it's like there's no light there. So um, in several instances, we spent quite a bit of time in just dealing with customers and, 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 their, and their issues that they may have had with Wi-Fi. I've got one question for Kim, and I'm going to have, I think, have, I've got at least two witnesses with a hard stop time, so I may see if some folks can be a little more flexible. But Kim, the thing I found interesting, because there was a discussion, I think, here Friday that kind of implied we shouldn't allow um, low people to purchase 10-1 or 5-1 or any, I think it went as far as 25-3 because we're gonna give them 100-100. And if you put that out, people will buy it. But what you said is you put it out and people still bought, 20% of them still bought the old 10-1. Did that change when the kids started staying home and doing schoolwork? Did they upgrade or? Um... We had very, we had a few people upgrade, but not very many at all. You know, I'm, I'm talking just a, just a few that upgraded. Um, no, and and even with our uh, get connected uh, grant of the 24 locations. Um, a little more than half took the 25 package and the rest of them stayed at the 10-1 package. Um, and it's, you know, our first build was actually a, a small section around the lake that are, that are second homes. Um, and very few of those people take more than the 10-1. It's um, as much as I'd like to say you build it, they're gonna come, uh, they don't. Um, and it's, that's part of the business model people need to understand is, is just because you pass a bunch of homes, they're not going to take a higher package. Um, and, and the 10 one speed, um, you know, you can be running three video devices on it um, comfortably. You got a gamer in the house or you got a couple of VPNs, you're gonna have issues, but the 10 one, uh, is a nice package for now. We're all building to, to increase as much as we can, but the reality is 10-1 works very well for a lot of people. So yeah, they don't need 100, 100. The business next door might, that's uploading blueprints or films, but not your average person if they can get their schoolwork and, okay. Just thought that was interesting. Roger, I'm, 
Gonna let you finish up here. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and talk about the affordability. I, I mean, the, the whole thing that oh. I can say in terms of, of the independence and, and, and all the carriers, we really reacted to, to um, the Keep America Connected pledge that, that was, was um, started at the, at the federal level. And, and we, whether we signed on or not, we all agreed not to disconnect customers. And then we responded very well to Commissioner Kearney's uh, call to action. Um, VTEL put in hot, 15 additional hotspots. We added hotspots. And at, at the hotspots that, um, that we already had, we took off time limits and increased the speeds. Uh, at the same time, we um, identified locations where there were students um, that didn't have service and we, and we got them connected. Uh, for Waitsfield, we still have 28 students that are connected uh, and, and we're, we're pr um, providing that service free of charge. I know um, that VTEL had uh, approximately, uh, I want to say, 14 students that they have connected free and are still on, and they uh, actually connected 153 wirelessly. So we've done what we can, and, and we've actually built to some locations that didn't have service. So we, we've we done what we, we can to, to the best we can um, to get students connected um, during the pandemic and, and keep them connected. Um, at the same time, uh, participated in the average program uh, to make sure that people's bills stayed caught up and at the same time participated in the broadband lifeline program. Now, uh, there's still the mor moratorium on um, no disconnections for the voice service. And for some of us, um, by the way, the rules work. Um, if, we can, if we're not disconnecting for voice, we're not disconnecting for broadband. So that's been the case at Waitsfield and uh, remains to be seen how that does impact us on a bottom line uh, when, when it does end. Other companies have started disconnecting their, their broadband and, um, and, and that's a decision that they, that's a tough decision because they take a look at it each and every month and try to determine how that customer really will really be impacted. Um, in addition to everything that the state's done, uh, there is also the federal lifeline program that provides $7.25 for broadband connections that are 25 or three or greater. Uh, and at the same time, 525 for voice services. I will say though that the program is not as effective as it used to be given that uh, they keep raising the speed of the broadband and oftentimes uh, to get that the 725 for the the broadband you may have a price increase going from 10 over 1 to 25 over 3 so so the customer may come out behind if in, in, in actually applying to the federal um, lifeline program the lifeline program was always there for voice and this next year um, there are going to be some customers that no longer receive the federal lifeline because the voice portion is going to be going away um, with that being said, the, we're hoping that this FCC will take another look at it and, and, and the, the program and see what they can do in, in, in revitalizing it in some form or fashion so that we can keep customers connected. Um, we took, um, Waitsfield did get some grant money, um, connectivity initiative grant money, and uh, we built two, an, an additional um, 224 locations and those are 224 locations that, that I can say that without that funding, we probably wouldn't have gotten to last year. So every little bit of funding helps us get people connected. And we're, we're an advocate to, um, to, for the, the governor's 16 million that he's put aside for grants to let's, let's, how, let's see how we can get that um, Get that process started quickly so that we can plan and get that money invested in here and get more more connected um, because like i said each and every dollar that comes back to us um, for, for for the independent companies that are out there it's not going to planning it's not going to for business plans it's going directly back into to our networks and, and, and building building broadband to customers um, 
with that, I'll stop since I know you do have some time limits and, and I'll answer questions now or when you deem it to be appropriate. Well, I had one. You said you went, you extended to 225 for 24 homes. Did all of those homes sign up? So the, I know that we have the fiber into all the locations now except six. The majority of them, I will say, already had service, so they, they converted to a lower speed service to, to a fiber service um, okay. where the, they'll have the ability to purchase um, of up to one gig. Okay, we had, that's what we'd hoped would happen. I think what we're trying to find out is, did it in fact, and if the subsidies go away, will they stay connected? And I think we're doing kind of a business, you know, um, evaluation here, how much it's costing in think, public dollars. Yeah, I think more and more people realize, I mean, give, given all the needs today, um, more and more people realize that it's essential for them to have the service. And and in fact, it's, it's interesting from the standpoint of uh, it's gotten tough for us making decisions because those that need the fiber yell and scream very they're, they're our most vo vocal customers and they want fiber and they want it now and we, we we take a look at where they're located and they may have the ability to, to get 25 three today and they want more and in those instances we we have to say well we're not coming to you right now even though we you would like higher level of service because there are those that that are underserved and, and we need to get to them first. And that's that's just something that we're gonna face and, until we get 100% fiber to everyone. Yeah, I think it was a sale I lost that that was one of the circumstances <laughs> over in your area. But it was up, yeah. I mean, they had at least 25.3, actually they had better than 25.3 but they wanted a much higher upload and said, we just can't do it now. We're gonna get everybody on one place. Mm -hmm. Senator Hardy, Senator Sorotkin, is that a new hand no, it's or an old, old hand? It's an, it's old, an hand. old hand? Okay, Senator <laughs> Hardy. Thank you, <laughs> Madam Chair. Um, Roger, I just had a question on something you said I didn't follow. You, you mentioned you were talking about the federal program and whether or not um, people were using it and that in some cases they ended up worse off if they used that program. Could you explain what you meant by that? So at one point in time at, at the federal level, you would get to $7.25 for a speed of 10 over one. And they've increased the speed to get to subsidy or to get to 7.25, um, seven over to 725 to, to 25 over three. In some instances, a company may charge, say, eight dollars for 25 over more for 25 over three. So for the customer to continue to get the seven dollar, twenty-five dollar credit, they would have to up their service to 25 over three, possibly pay eight dollars more and only get a seven dollar and twenty-five. I see. Okay, so as they increase their speed, it costs more, and then the subsidy was less meaningful, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. That doesn't happen in all instances, but that's that has been pointed out to the FCC is if you want to keep people connected, you should allow them to pick the level of service that they, they want to be connected at. Okay. And then um, just a couple other clarifying things. You also um, mentioned that you still had some hotspots out there that you mentioned 28 students that you still had hotspots for. So did you... Did you take away hotspots, or are did they no longer need them? What 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 happened? You had more at one point, is that right? No, we we added to the number we had, and those that the existing ones that we we took away the time limits, increased the amount of bandwidth to them. Oh, okay, so you didn't remove some hotspots in the middle of the school year. Okay, and so how many did you have before the pandemic? For what's I asked. I asked this question today and I didn't get an answer, but okay. we have 21 right now. You have 21 right now. Okay. And um, 
the other thing that you mentioned that there's still the federal requirement that you can't disconnect voice but you can now disconnect broadband if people are not paying. Is that correct? Was there a moratorium on a, the broadband disconnect at the federal level that's now gone away? Or was there ever a broadband disconnect moratorium? So the, the moratorium, that was part of the pledge. Oh, was it was okay. And when, when the pledge ran out, well, there, there, there were actually two port phases of the pledge. Everyone pretty much signed up for the first one. Some didn't sign up for the second one. And that was that was what we said we would do in terms of the broadband. Now, because broadband isn't regulated um, at the state level, it can be disconnected at, at the state level. Right, okay. Yeah, and that that's the problem in some cases that we, we can't regulate it at the state level and that, for us, I see that as a problem as a state legislator, so. But thank you, That that's helpful. Senator Sorokin, all right. New hand. New, have a hand. New, new hand. Up. Okay, I can't put them down like I could oh, with I new know. hands, I, so you need to put I'll your have, own hands down. Well, you know what? I'll do it right now. Okay. How's that? That's good. Now you can talk. Tech savvy. Um, so the existing broadband subsidy program that ended in December, that was what, $40 a month? Is that correct? Okay. And how many? Uh, hey, Roger, what? we can't hear you for some reason. I'm sorry. It was increased to eighty. Uh, I'm it not was mistaken. forty. No, he says state programs, forty dollars. State program. Yeah. Okay. And um, what percentage would you say roughly of your customers took advantage of that, or would you know that? Maybe 5%. Okay. Okay. And, um, and did you see, did you have any feel as to what's, what was the average charge for broadband that they were taking that $40 subsidy on? How much was their bill versus how much was the subsidy? Oh, I would have to, I would have to look that up um, in probably in the range of $80 though. So it was, they were getting half of their bill covered by the subsidy? Yes. Okay. Um, and the new program that's coming in is a $50 subsidy for somewhat different population, more means-based than, than needing telehealth or schooling or job remote work. Yes, I, I think that the, at the federal level, they're still looking into yeah. to the requirements and, and how they'll be applied. So I guess I'm generally asking, you know, you've seen a lifeline program for your telephone services and for broadband. I mean, how important do you see a subsidy program for your ratepayers for selected ratepayers being i mean it, you know we have subsidy programs for electricity and other kinds of services how important do you rate broadband in that oh i i rated up there very highly and and those that that did apply uh, i think it, it it made a difference in them being able to to use um, their dollars on on some other thing, possibly to feed their their families or to um, or to help pay their rent. Um, so I, I think it just makes it, it helps those that 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 are in need. Okay, thank you. Schedule. Um, I've got Jeff Austin, and Erica Smith have to leave by three. Ahead of them is Holly and. Groschner and Stephanie Lee, can you two stay with us a little longer? Certainly. Okay. I can too, Stephanie. Okay, that's great. So we will go then down to Erica Smith. And I see Jeff, I don't know if you two have a, a presentation or who's, who's going where, but you have the floor. 
Great. Uh, thank you, Chair Cummings. It's nice to see everyone again. Um, so thanks for having us back. And actually, just a quick introduction. I wanted to introdu introduce um, Erica Smith. She is our new Senior Manager for Regulatory and Legislative Affairs. I've done a lot of work in the, in the Vermont legislature um, in my previous position, um, handling regulatory and government affairs uh, for Consolidated Communications. Um, actually, recently over the last few months, I moved into a new position as Senior Director of our Consolidated Fiber Build Strategy for the country. And Eric has moved into the role of, of regulatory and um, legislative. So you'll hear a lot more from Erica, but as it relates to uh, today, I uh, just wanted to introduce Erica. I'm not sure if Erica, if you had anything else you wanted to add before I jumped into our testimony for today. I don't think so. Just um, to say thank you for having us and um, it's nice to meet you all virtually. So I look forward to working with you in the future. And so, so today as we uh, transition, um, I'm gonna go through some of the affordability uh, that, that some of the questions that came up, uh, Chair Cummings, uh, as we're preparing for our testimony. And I'm also gonna talk a little bit about broadband, but we'll keep this brief. And I think that uh, maybe some of the stuff that we talk about today may, may result in uh, maybe a, another, uh, another time in the committee, um, if, that's, um, if that's acceptable to the committee, but I'll start- There'll be other times. Yeah, perfect. Broadband we're, is ongoing. Uh, we'll keep talking about that for sure. So as it relates to affordability, a lot of the things that Roger and, and Kim said uh, in, in relates to the pandemic, things that we also participated in, Keep America's Connected Pledge, um, the, the Vermont um, Arrearage Program, the broadband subsidy programs, really involved uh, with the Department of Public Service on those programs. Really, you know, give kudos where they where they deserve for sure. A lot of hard work, a lot of hours, and a lot of effort put into those programs. And really want to thank the department uh, for all the work and all the collaboration, getting you know getting those programs out in a short period of time and making them as success as successful as they were. So I appreciate that work. Um, as it relates to other things, uh, just as we work through the pandemic, like everyone else. We provided, um, we had a program to provide free internet service for 60 days uh, for, you know, for new customers, uh, folks who needed a school at home, work at home kind of situation. We connected um, over 400 new Vermont households with um, remote learning needs um, when the pandemic began through this program. And uh, those were, you know, basically, and some new customers or some existing customers were also honored with that program, but it was mainly geared toward new customers. Um, affordability, again, we, with the state programs, we also participate in the Federal Lifeline program that Roger was just talking about. Um, we're actively engaged as a company, and Erica has been engaged in the, um, the FCC's Emergency Broadband Benefit Program, which is obviously, as everybody knows, is currently being de developed. Um, the subsidy programs, um, Dependent on availability. Um, now, that one of the things about affordability, right? I mean, it is key. It's a huge topic when it relates to broadband equality or connectivity equality. Though a lot of the services that Consolidated provides today on, on the internet side, we have a wide range of service options. Um, and I know I'll throw out speeds and I know that they, they're gonna sound old and antiquated, but there are some households who um, who do order service at the three meg level, three megabit, that's download. Um, we do have services that customers can order at the 100 megabit level. It's a lot of that is the um, copper network. It's, DS, it's our DSL service. It's distance sensitive, the further you're away from the electronics, uh, kind of the lower speeds. But we have about 12 different um, price tiers anywhere from three meg to seven meg to 10 meg. We talked about that 10 one service, 15 meg, 25 meg, 40 meg. So as it kind of relates to affordability and, and accessibility, we do, have, we do have a bunch of different ranges that customers can order and, and a bunch of different speed uh, or a bunch of different price points related to those speeds. And, um, and it's something that I think the committee, and this may be a, a different discussion, a further discussion. A lot of the talk that we've had, you know, with Consolidated Communications as an incumbent local exchange carrier, Consolidated purchase of Fairpoint territories back in 2017, 
that's something everybody's kind of familiar with. Um, we, have a, we have a lot of fiber in the footprint, but not a lot of fiber to the premise. And we've talked a lot in this committee and other committees about fiber to the premise, the ability to have gigabit or multiple gigabit symmetrical, right? Download and upload speeds to as many Vermont residents, you know, as we can get it to. And a lot of the discussion that we've had is copper DSL, right? Now, new technologies with copper DSL get higher speeds, but the, you know, right, there are certain limitations um, on those technologies. So again, something that I can get into just on a high level and you can let me know, Chair Cummings, uh, where you want me to stop here, but Consolidated announced back in September that we um, entered into a strategic partnership with Searchlight pa uh, Partners. And that, is, um, that has resulted in a large influx of capital to the company. We're taking that capital influx and we're actually gonna be building out um, over the next five years in the main New Hampshire and Vermont territory, just to give you an idea where that is, over 11,000 miles of fiber. Um, and this is fiber to the prem, multi-gigabit, symmetrical um, internet service. So we've taken, we've talked about affordability, right? Overbuilding, we've talked about the copper service. Well, the fiber is the future, you know, for us. We've talked about things like future proof and how do we get there? Well, this fiber program, fiber, ex accelerated fiber expansion program, I will call it. This already started in Vermont. Um, so we've really accelerated this. We're building in 14 of our wire centers, which cover about eight, uh, 28 towns um, in 2021 alone, over 500 miles of fiber for the premise service in 2021. And when we're all done after five years, um, just on this program, there's RDOF discussions, and I know that's probably another discussion. We're going to be building over 2,500 miles of fiber to the premise uh, services here in Vermont. So I won't, I, I have a, I could do a couple hours on this, but in the, in the spirit of time, and I know we're talking about affordability, the only thing else I'll add is we're really looking for, really looking to build state-of-the-art fiber to as many folks as we can. And when we're talking about affordability, right now we're looking at our 50 megabit symmetrical, so up and down uh, services, the beginning price point is going to be about $35 a month for that service. So just want to kind of put out on the affordability side that we're thinking about this in all different ways. Um, how do we get the most bang for our buck? How do we build out to as many people as we can affordably? And then how do we make this affordable, you know, for our customers? So um, I will stop there because like I said, I could go on for a while, but, and see if anyone in the committee has questions. Hardy. Thank you. Oh, everybody moved. So, okay, there's Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> it gets disorienting when people, the, the little boxes move. Um, well, thank you for that. Um, I have, did you, I, I didn't look on our website. Did you provide a uh, written testimony? And if so, or if not, um, do you have a map of that 25 <laughs> mile plan of building? I love the term fiber to the prem. Now I can sound very cool, like I know what I'm talking about. Um, do you, can you give us a map on what your plan is? Yeah, um, we not yet. We don't have. It's a five-year plan, so we don't have anything kind of basically outside 2021. Um, you know, completely mapped out. We've done really high-level uh, reviews of where we're going to go. We're, our estimate is going to be passing over 210,000 locations. So as we're looking at the big picture, we haven't done the detailed um, engineering, like boots on the ground, that needs to happen to make sure that we cover everyone that we plan on covering. Okay. Uh, so that is something that we'll continue to work on, though. Okay. Do you have the 2021, any, any map or any plan that you could provide, even if it's just the one year, that would be helpful to see where, as we're looking at lots of different proposals and plans, to see how much of our state we're going to end up patchworking together, um, higher speed coverage. Um, so if you have that, that would be great to see. Um, the other question I wanna ask is on a, a different topic, but um, other members of the committee 
um, will know what I'm talking about. We've over the last couple of days actually gotten um, s several emails from customers who are, let's just say, not very pleased with your company and have um, customer re uh, cons related complaints. And one specifically caught my eye um, as something that sounded um, really egregious during the um, pandemic, um, which was um, a, a you know rental change in home. So whoever was living in the home and one renter canceled their service, and the next renter tried to tried to connect to service and was told multiple times by Consolidated, "Oh, we'll we'll come, to, we'll get you, we'll get to you, we'll get to you, we'll get to you." It dragged out over months and months and months never got connected, finally consolidated, told them we, we don't service that address anymore. When um, the address had previously in you know April or May been serviced by consolidated. And we've just heard continued stories about a lack of clear, clear communication from consolidated to customers. And I'm just, I'm just concerned about your customer service and your customer communication, particularly in this time of real, real um, need for families and um, for for customers to have this service. So, what is your company doing to serve customers better and to communicate with them better? Yeah, I can. And Eric, if there's anything you want to add as I'm going through, um, just kind of throw that out there. But um, so individual situations. I, it's hard for me to address that, but I can say that the way that we built our network, our DSL network, is you run fiber from the central office to a remote terminal. And this remote terminal is out further into the rural territories. That remote terminal has a certain amount of capacity um, to be able to provide a certain amount of customers with internet service. Now, as you can imagine, the pandemic has created more need, right, for, for that kind of folks who, previously did not need or want internet, then turned around. So our capacity, definitely we saw an increase of capacity and increase of orders. Now, the way that the design is, are those, those that capacity at that remote terminal is not for individual address locations. So for example, you're in, now I don't know all the details of that one specifically, but in that situation, I can foresee that if somebody did disconnect um, in that, that port basically in the electronics became, avail became available. Somebody else on a different address put an order in, used that port, we connected their service. That might have exhausted the ports um, in that area. When you exhaust the ports, then you have to build new electronics for more capacity. So again, not knowing all the details about how you're explaining it. Now that those conversations, um, those are tough because again, it's we have to go out there and we have to build more capacity as we're building out. So we have to schedule it. Uh, we, have to, we have to get the electronics. I know Kim Gates mentioned getting materials in a pandemic has been a challenge on timing and things like that. So we're happy any to research and, and take care of anything. If anyone here has situations like that, send them to Erica, you know, send them to myself, we'll get them to the right folks. But I will pivot a little bit to that, that Absolutely, we want to be sending consistent messages, you know, to our customers. Right now is a really hard time to not have internet access. You really need it. With school at home, work at home, telemedicine, everything we're doing these days is really um, required, you know, to have an internet connection. So we understand that part of this um, fiber build that we talked about is a whole digital transformation also. It's world-class service, um, our, our internet technical support is changing, everything we're doing in the company um, is transforming. And we've started putting this together back in September. We've got a little bit of runway, we've got some work to do. These situations, we definitely wanna know about so we can feed those back uh, because we do wanna provide that world-class service. And when you get out into those rural areas and we have got the copper plant and the DSL, we've got some, we've got some good speeds, We've got capacity in a lot of areas, but we definitely have run into challenges in some areas with capacity. And it sounds like your example happens to be one of those. Okay, well, I'm happy to send those along to you or Kim, or Erica, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, but I, I just, it's pretty um, consistent that we hear concerns with Consolidated's 
customer service. So if you're going to be building out in Vermont, that sounds great. But if you can't provide the customer service to those Vermonters who then are, are using your technology and using your services, then it doesn't really matter if they have broadband, if they can't use it and they can't get their questions at, answered. So sure. I, I just, you need to focus on that more. Yep, no, that is a high priority in the company, not just here in Vermont, um, but across our footprint. So, no, we actually, we absolutely hear that message. We're actually putting in some new indicators, a uh, national provider score, service provider score. So we can, we have more of a con, more contact with our customers. They can provide more feedback. We can, we have avenues to hear what they're saying and we have avenues to, to address issues like that. So. As I mentioned, as we're kind of transforming the company, and it really is that, this was really Consolidated's vision when they purchased the territories back in 2017. We had a good core network. We had limited or no fiber to the premise, um, you know, customer service. So as we're rolling into a little past year three, we've got the capital influx. We have the ability to do this complete transformation um, and, and customer service is, at the, is really at the top of that list. So I absolutely hear you, Senator, and totally agree. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you. And yes, thank you for the time. Wherever your next hard meeting. Oh, Sandra Bray has a question. <laughs> Senator McDonald's training me to be extra clear on, on terminology, which is a good thing. So fiber to the premises, does that mean to the property or to the building itself so that there's no gap between the ONT or whatever and, 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 the, and the dwelling space or business space? Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question, Sarah. It's a, really, it's a great question. We're building fiber on the poles. So we're gonna go past you know, over 210,000 locations in Vermont. That makes the fiber available if somebody orders service. Um, one of the challenges is when you're building out anything, um, you wanna make sure that you look at the cost of the build, right? You wanna build it as efficiently as you can. And you don't wanna have any, um, um, let's say, we don't have, wanna have any assets out there that you're stranded assets, I guess would be a, would be a term. So if we went and we built, um, we built it on the poles and then we ran a drop to everybody's homes. Not everybody is gonna order their service. We're really looking at increasing our fiber availability to approximately 70 or 70, 75% of our addresses in Vermont. Um, but we will still gonna need our uh, people to call and order. So then we can put the drop on their house. Then we can put the ONT, like you mentioned, inside their house. So it'll be available on the polls. And when people order it, then obviously we can provide service to the individual dwellings or the, or the business uh, buildings. So fiber to the premises means basically to the address and then someone needs at that point. So that's a checkbox for fiber to the premises. And then an actual connection is one more step. I, I would agree with that. Yep. Yep. Okay. And um, uh, well, one other quick question is, is there any kind of chart when, when one of your customers says, you know, I do want to upgrade, um, is there a fee to bring them over, swap them over from copper to fiber? You know, I, that's actually a good question. I'll have to look. I, I believe that there's an installation fee, but we have promotions that we're working on that would waive that fee. It's, it's something like $99 potentially for the connection charge. But again, we're looking at promotions um, to waive that fee, um, depending on timing and things like that. So what we would have to do is, it does require us to have a, a technician truck roll, you know, so we've got that overhead to go out and connect the fiber, get it into the house, place the, the ONT um, and, and get everything running for them. So sure. I, I don't know that answer 100%, but that's, that's how I see it today. Okay, and last quick question is, um, the slowest service uh, someone takes fiber is what level, please? It would be 50 meg symmetrical, 50 by 50. Okay, so 50 and up. Yep, um, and actually when we roll this out, um, we're looking at four speed tiers. So it'd be a 50 meg by 50 meg, 250 by 250, one gig by one gig, and two gig by two gig. Okay, 
Um, and one other, <laughs> your mileage may vary question. Uh, is that an up to 50 or does that mean that 50 is the floor when I sign up for that service? Yeah, 50 is the floor. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Looking into how many people did, did you did have, I'm sure, some um, programs to make it easier for people to, to sign up and to afford and, um, and do you know how many people signed up using those programs? When has the program ended? When, when will it end? And then I think we're interested in how many people stay signed up. Just some general numbers. Um, I know with the with our two month free or sixty day free service for you know families with students, we had about four hundred and twenty eight um, you know new customers sign up for that program. So that's the program. But I don't have the data if they stayed with us. You know how many of those four twenty eight still because we ran that program through the summer of, of two thousand twenty. Um, you know through that period of time for folks to get signed up spring and summer. And as it relates to like the Vermont Broadband Subsidy Program and the Arrearage Program, um, I don't have those exact numbers on how many folks uh, utilize those programs. Any numbers you could get us, because what we're trying to figure out is, we know how many premises we've run fiber by, but we don't know how many actual customers have signed up because they sign up with you, not Right. The department. And so we're trying to get a handle on how many signed up, how many went away when the subsidy went away. Um, just because as we go into the future, I think we're looking at, um, you know, how, how necessary is a subsidy and then what speeds they're signing up for. So and how that state subsidy would work with that new federal, you know, program, yeah, and all those combinations. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, we can definitely Find provide out. some data for you. Okay, that would be great. Great. All right, other questions? Uh, Sandra Sorotkin. Uh, I should know this, but um, when you say you participated in the, the rearage program, could you describe that program? Is that the rearage program for all utilities? And did it extend to broadband? Yeah, that was yeah, that was the arrearage program, Senator, for all utilities. And the it did not extend in a program that was really on, on for our purposes for the on the telephone or voice side of the house. It really was for that basic local exchange service, that dial tone service. So that was the VCAP program. And then the broadband side had its own broadband subsidy program, which was the $40 a month uh, right. that Clay mentioned. But but there was no arrearage program for broadband. Uh, correct. I, I think the, the way the program, and anybody can um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the way the program worked was you, you had to sign up for the program, you had to apply for it, but you could retroactive those $40 a month programs back to March of, of the beginning of the pandemic. So it's not an arrearage, but it did have a retroactive part of that that would retroactive back to March of 2020. And that's correct. Jeff has correctly described the program. Okay, so while for telephone service and utilities, there was some back waiver of back bills for broadband, there was just a credit program that you could apply retroactively for, but you couldn't wipe out your entire bills that were due. Right, you'd have to, if you actually had, um, Pass to uh, basic local exchange, so pass to dial tone service. Talking about broadband. Oh, just broadband. Yeah, then that was the broad, just the broadband subsidy program. Okay. The effect could have been the same, right? Theoretically, right. And, and certainly, again, you can correct me, but um, if a customer was past due and they applied for and were approved for the program, the charges could have been applied retroactively. So for some customers, I think that benefit would have worked that way but it, it wasn't designed in the same way that the arrearage program was for basic telephone service and other utilities. Okay. That is my understanding as well. And Clay should correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. 
opt up, so I guess he's not going to uh, correct you. Uh, I had trouble getting to the unmute button. Uh, no, the, the, the program wasn't uh, intended uh, to be for rearages, but early on we had identified that the, the VCAP program, the legislation didn't cover uh, broadband because it only covered uh, utilities that uh, were were um, covered by the PUC's moratorium on disconnections, which did not apply to broadband. Um, so, in picking that forty dollar number, um, you know that was a an an, a, an average uh, broadband bill. It, it didn't necessarily cover everyone's uh, total um, broadband expenditure, but um, it went a long way, and for a lot of customers, it did end up covering um, the arrearage. Um, technically, customers could get up to $400 for all 10 months. The average subsidy was uh, $313. So um, we did hear back from many customers to um, use the program to cover their arrearages that they had um, accrued since March. Um, but it also assisted people who did I think make great sacrifices to pay their bill, they still ended up getting a credit in the end. Um, so it was more expansive than just simply covering a rear um, While While you have the mic, Clay, uh, do you know or can you put together some sort of uh, memo as to what some of the other providers, the bigger providers in Vermont provided in terms of subsidies for their low-income customers or for telemedicine or telehealth. I, I keep hearing that Comcast and other things have these programs that are somewhat means-tested where they're providing some help and paying people's bill. It'd be nice to have that all in one place. I don't assume, yeah. it, it may be proprietary, but I don't assume it's not common knowledge out there. So. The, the uh, several carriers do have programs. I think Comcast is the most widely known. Um, it, it's actually well regarded um, uh, among consumer advocates, at least compared to other, other carriers. I know Comcast is not on the, uh, on the call today, but um, Comcast program, I think is $10 um, and you can qualify for it if you qualify for free or reduced lunch or, or SNAP, uh, some of those other federal programs, much in line with the Lifeline program. Um, it's, it's pretty good and it, uh, there are many takers of that in Vermont and we covered that with our broadband subsidy. So a lot of the people that qualify for that program, we paid the extra $10 through the arrearage program. Um, but uh, that one's a popular one. Charter also has one. Um, and I believe some of the telephone companies, as, as we've heard today, has one. Um, and EC Fiber, when they testify, we'll probably talk about a program that they initiated in response to the pandemic. Um, so there are several programs. We can try to put something together for you um, on that. But Comcast is, is the largest. Um, in the past, um, some have had difficulty getting the, some of those programs if they've had a previous arrearage with, um, with the provider offering uh, the subsidy. With the new federal subsidy uh, that will be rolled out in March, um, arrearages should not be a problem. So if someone would otherwise qualify for one of those low income programs, they can sign up um, through the FCC's program. So I just wanna make sure I heard you right. You say the subsidy that was a good one was Comcast is $10 a month? I believe it's $10 a month. Um, I'll have to go back and check, but $10 a month for a 25 three service. Thank you. Which costs what, $60 a month? I, I don't know because I don't think Comcast sells a 25-3 service otherwise. Um, uh, their packages, I believe, are in the 60 to $80 range for um, their, their common internet packages. Thank you. 
you have a question or did you get your answer? Yes, Senator McDonald. I, 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 for 10 minutes, I didn't know what Senator Sorokin meant when he said broadband. Uh, we finally got an answer that we're talking about 25-3 or, or um, so it, it's kind of tough to understand what's being discussed when it's not explained. So. Okay. Any other questions for Jeff or Erica? Okay, if not, I'm going back to the order and I've got Holly Gross Groschner from EC Fiber. And Holly, welcome again. And thank you for working with our schedule. Uh, no problem, Madam Chair. And um, I will share my screen in a moment. I'm thrilled to be here actually. And we took you at your word that you wanted to talk about affordability uh, because I represent not just EC Fiber today. And in fact, I'm a delegate to their governing board from Corinth and we're, we're volunteers, but I'm also the volunteer uh, chair of the board of something called Equal Access to Broadband which is an organization that EC Fiber has initiated uh, through seed funding this year to address the affordability issue. And I'm happy to be here to talk to you about it, although I may not be able to uh, take some of your questions about deployment uh, because we've really separated these two activities. Um, I am gonna share my screen, uh, not because I don't think you read, but actually just because I think it would be great to have a very um, consolidated look at this. But when I am doing this, I don't see you. So please speak up if you need me to stop. Um, I don't see everybody either. So I think we've got it down to, we just holler politely. Okay, then I, I can I can do that. It'll be like family supper. Yes. Um, so I know I know some of you, but um, I'm a former partner Downs Rathlin and Martin in the telecom practice. I help bring wireless to uh, cell phone service to Vermont. Um, I was general counsel at a company called Crown Castle International, and they started the international facilities infrastructure build uh, business. Uh, that supports cell phone service. So um, that was uh, a national network of towers and infrastructure, including fiber. And I'm the former general counsel of the Vermont Telecom Authority and hello, Senator Gray. Um, and you may know me, I have been on TV as the CEO of Vermont PBS. Uh, and I am proud to say that I uh, authored the merger of Vermont PBS and VPR to ensure that uh, public media service will continue in Vermont for a very long time. So um, there is great news, especially in these times, we all agree. And um, I think it's great to get our heads above the clouds here and say, isn't it fabulous that we all agree that everyone needs broadband service? I think we all agree that it's not affordable by everyone. And we could say that the easy thing to do is to reduce the price, but that is not the only thing we need to do. Um, we do have $3.2 billion, which is sounding like a lot of money, but is only scheduled to last for eight to 10 months, as Commissioner Tierney said. Um, this is a target subsidy of $50 a month, and that will help, but it is using an existing system, and as the national carriers have uh, offered in their testimony, this builds on the Lifeline program, and it means that the access is just about how do you subsidize that individual customer. It doesn't deal with getting the service to the customer or helping the customer make decisions. So equal access to broadband is here because 
EC Fiber and the other CUDs have a broadband mission to serve all the neighbors. We see that that's going to require helping these CUDs who don't have big government affairs or subsidy programs themselves to figure out how to plug in and how to plug into the networks that exist in communities to help low income families. The proposed service rate at EC Fiber for low income families is 25 megabits square. And I assume that that's a phrase that folks know um, for $22 a month. Could you explain just and, 25 square means? Yes, that means, means when, when, you see, when you see the federal standard, they set the definition of broadband to be 25 megabits upload and three, I'm sorry, 25 megabits download and three megabits upload. And EC Fiber delivers all of its services symmetrically, which means its upload and its downloads are the same. It makes no judgment by whether you're uploading big files at work at home or whether you're downloading big files. So it's selling symmetrical service. And that is planned to be offered at about $22 a month. And that's interestingly about what the federal government targeted its subsidies at. The retail rate for the same service is $72. So we're trying to find that $50 subsidy to help folks, but it isn't enough just to find the subsidy. We have to find a way to help folks know how to find this service and that they need this service. As the Pew Charitable Trust Research recently said, people who are in low income families don't access this service because they don't think they need it, because they don't understand it, and they're afraid of contract commitments. The Comcast program at $9.95 a month, it is fabulous, except there's barriers to entering that program, and it's scary. So people do love it if they can have it. EC Fiber and the other CUDs, of course, serve areas where these national companies have not found it possible to um, string fiber or any other service. So we're trying to deal with folks that are specifically in these targeted areas without access to any of these other subsidy programs. So a national funding process looks a bit like it to the national carriers. It's a nice linear package. The customer goes out and defines it, his or her own eligibility on a verification database that's run by a national uh, service provider. There is a benefit coverage established in the FCC's uh, picture right now, given the 3.2 billion, and we hope that that's continued, the funding for that is continued. Um, that's about a $50 benefit. But please know that the carrier sets the price for the service. So whether $50 covers all the service or a part of the service, that's up to the carrier. The carrier also has particular obligations like making sure they're actually providing broadband then there's an amount and application of the benefit and a distribution of the benefit. Those two steps are done by the government, not by the carrier. And then the funding sources, of course, Congress, program administration is again the government, and transition. Transition really means bringing low-income families online. So, we at Equal Access to Broadband has spent the last three or four months talking to school officials and caseworkers about what broadband really looks like to low-income families in Vermont. So first, there's the problem of where are you located? Is there even service available? No one lets you know that proactively. You have to figure that out. And if you happen to live in a building where there's a landlord, there's an added complication. Then you have to determine whether you qualify. Part of that is whether you qualify under a federal program. And then there's the question of, 
has the carrier processed your paperwork. This is a you know multi-step process, and sometimes, as in the Lifeline program, there are government agencies that help you figure that out. Sometimes there are not. And many of the caseworkers we've spoken to are at agencies that are trying to scrape together dollars to help do uh, funding for the drop to the low income families household, or just trying to help the family sort out what they can afford because they don't understand that they may have cable, they may have a mobile phone, they may have a landline phone. What do they need? What can they do to change their economic picture to make this affordable? And then there's the wait. The carrier has to make approvals, the landlord makes approvals. There's a question about how the federal benefit will arrive. And then there's the actual linking up to that, um, the, the, the drop that we've been talking about. There is a whole area that no one talks about in terms of tech refresh. Um, you know, I'd hate to think that we're talking to the folks in the old, one of the oldest states in the union about whether they need high speed broadband. Um, I know my mom doesn't think she needs it. I know that I, a Topsham telephone customer, have lots of days when I wonder how we're going to survive because we we haven't we are operating on DSL. That's more like a speed of six megabits per second down and three quarters of a megabit per second up. So is our television connected to our internet service? Yes, it is. Is our, our cell phones? Well, by gosh, they are, because there's no cell service here in Corinth. And what about our TV? Is it too old? Can we use it on this new broadband service? Somebody has to help sort out these questions. And this activity gets pushed down to teachers and caseworkers. And we don't think that that's a good a good place for it to live, but it's certainly not a good place for it to live if those folks aren't supported in understanding what, what the question is. And then there's the financial management of all this. The cost of devices, the cost of the drop, additional monthly recurring costs, which create great fear in this population. So here we are, equal access to broadband is trying to support the CED in, in uh, delivering custom community service. So we'd like to see there be fric frictionless registration of the CUDs in the National Verifier database. That's the database that folks like Comcast are going to access. We're going to support outreach through existing channels, that schools and caseworkers, to make sure that the community that needs this subsidy and needs the help knows about it. We're going to try to expand the standards for eligibility to include free and reduced lunch. And I'm told by caseworkers that even then, when you're dealing on a percentage of the federal poverty level, you're leaving a lot of folks behind who really need help just on a cash flow basis. So EC Fiber went out this year. They're supporting multiple families. I think there's presently about 50 families that they are supporting and they waive the charges for the drops to those families because urgency was there. They knew that this was important and they had to do it on an ad hoc basis because of the urgency and because frankly, this is new. So we're trying to build a more systemic approach to this, including an arrearage program because our research says that there are going to be arrearages and we need to not be disconnecting people. We need to be helping them with continuous coverage. So um, that provides a little bit of a window on what we're trying to do. We've seen a price tag for our initiative of around $350,000 to get set up and start distributing this program. So as you know, school is your, in your car is not the answer. 
um, we're trying to make sure that we're not leaving the lowest income families in Vermont living in their cars at a Wi-Fi hotspot by their local library. And, you know, uh, I think it was WCAX or no, it was Vermont Digger recently reported on teachers that are spending their days in their school parking lot accessing Wi-Fi. Um, we are very concerned that this creates a multi-class society or worse, a disconnected portion of our society. And we don't, we want to be one community. So that's why we're here. So um, please support equal access to broadband. Anything you can do to build us into your uh, funding strategies, we would uh, uh, very much appreciate. And because all of you are getting so good at these vocab words, if you'd like to join me and help us create this new support mechanism that helps tailor support for low-income families in Vermont, please just raise your hand. Thank you. Okay. So it's Rockin, are you raising your hand or are you asking a question? Um, both raising my hand in support and asking a question. Holly, you're obviously very knowledgeable and a great resource for us. I, I got to ask the same question, though. I, I'm i shaking my head on the Comcast subsidy that people are just falling over themselves and supporting. And it seems like a it's like a 15% discount for low income people at $10. What am I missing here? Um, that discount is more than 15% against a Comcast bill. Um, the charge is 10 and the retail is, I, I think it's more than 60. Um, About 15%. Oh, I'm missing, I heard 15. Okay, so my question to you is this. Um, are you asking me how is this possible to make this big discount? I, I must be missing something. I guess I'm not viewing $10 as a big discount. Or no, no, they're only paying $10. Oh, okay. Thank you. That resolves the whole thing. Okay. Nope. Never mind. It's who's paying that wasn't clear. Never mind. Okay. Senator Hardy. Thank you, and thank you for clearing that up with Senator Sorokin. I thought you had it backwards in your in your mind, um, Michael. So I'm glad you got it. Um, the I I think it's one thing that's really important that you mentioned, and this goes to that Comcast program. It might sound really good, but the the barriers to entry are really quite big still because of. Uh, all the strings that are attached and anybody who's been a Comcast customer knows that they have tons of strings and really complicated pricing mechanisms and really complicated contracts and it's intimidating even if you have the resources to pay their bills, let alone if you don't have the resources. So I'm trying to understand exactly what you're pitching to us. Um, you're essentially you're asking for three hundred and fifty dollars. It sounds like you're asking for it. That's your ask in order to create or support a program that has been created by EC Fiber and maybe in partnership with other CUDs. I wasn't sure about that. And you would essentially be the interface and do the things now that social workers and teachers are doing and help people access these subsidies and help people navigate the complexities. Is, is that what you're saying? I, I just wanna make sure I'm clear on the program you're pitching. I'm really glad Senator Hardy that you've asked me for clarification because I've missed my mark. Um, the Equal access to broadband is filling a role that exists in part at commercial broadband providers. No one in the ISP community has a full-blown program for getting finding low-income families, making sure they're connected, making sure they understand how to use the equipment or have the right equipment. Our experience tells us that low-income families trust their caseworkers and the folks at their children's school. 
it is best if we support those folks in delivering access to these subsidies and access to information. We'd be happy to help develop an educational program, but I think it's best to use existing channels to deliver it. 350,000, that's what we see as our cost over the next two years. I've got a little experience in fundraising, but there is a lot of challenge right now in raising dollars. And this is a complex area. People say, oh, food, I understand that. But people don't understand how devastating it is to not have internet access during these times. And, and that's, that's the problem. So if this committee in drafting legislation and it's early in the season can help us, that would be, we would be grateful. Okay. And so third, thirdly, one, thir one more thing. Uh, you asked about our relationship to the CUDs. Um, we're setting up this program and uh, it is being set up with the support of EC Fiber but it's being modeled so that it can be used by all the CUDs, if not other non, uh, nonprofit uh, ISPs, so that uh, they know how to access the National Verifier database, for example, and they don't have to recreate a system for getting subsidies to uh, their low-income customers. The conversation with a low income family does not fall naturally from the lips of your broadband installer. <laughs> and so um, that's the support we're trying to bring. So you're, uh, I just want to thank you. That was helpful, but I just want to make sure I definitely have it correct. So your program would help the people who are already trying to help low income families connect to internet service, um, you would help them be able to do that better? <laughs> like the, the people who are showing up at your house to connect your broadband or the teachers at the school who are trying to explain to, to parents how to get it or the, the person at um, a social worker who's trying to help the family in their caseload. Is that correct? The school, the, school, yeah. the school and the social worker, and we're trying to get that information to the broadband carrier. So uh, I should make this really clear. We're going to do this. <laughs> I almost said come hell or high water. We're going to do this no matter what, because we need to. Um, it's almost a moral imperative. Uh, or perhaps it just is a moral imperative. Um, when you talk about a customer for a broadband company, it isn't normally the low income folks who come beating on the door, as was referenced earlier, wanting high speed internet connections. Because to them, that sounds like a contract and another monthly expense. And in fact, they're buying track phones so they can contain their expense. And a lot of times that's the only inter uh, interface to the internet. And so this is a way of reaching out to those folks and helping bring them with us into the 21st century. Thank you. I think part of what I heard you say is something it took me a while to understand, and I come from a background of working with low income people, is that when you have very limited means and you're living paycheck to paycheck, if you're lucky, and you every unanticipated expense causes fear. And so to sign a contract that says, I've got to pay for this service for X amount of time. And then to have equipment for what happens when it breaks, 
if it breaks, I can't afford to, to fix it, but I've got to pay this contract for the next six months. And you're saying that the resources to help folks get the equipment, to understand the equipment, to understand the contracts and you know what funds are there to help pay for them, what the contract really means and what happens if you need to get out of it. Uh, but to, it's traditional social work, you kind of hold their hand and walk them through the process and answer questions really at their level of understanding technology. And I love, you know, you call up and you ask for help and you get a technician. Um, and I'm frequently not sure what language that technician is speaking, but it sounds like it's in English, but it's nothing I understand. And I think that's what you're, you, you, and, but what you're saying to us is that's what it's going to take to get the most needy Vermonters hooked up to what is, if it isn't already going to be as essential as electricity or indoor plumbing. Um, yeah. This is our next big step. Okay. Yes. And, and we are not trying to take the role of the caseworker. We're just trying to support the caseworker so that they can have the conversation. The caseworker may not know all the technology. They, they do not. I, I mean, I've, I've, I've spent the time talking to a number of them and um, it, it's, it, I get into conversations that literally sound like, you know when they drop that thread thing and it goes into the box. Well, we can't. We talk in my language. We gotta get the we gotta get the landlord to say we can have the box. Yeah. And by the way, that's a challenge right there. There's a lot of low income folks who are at the mercy of their landlords for whether or not they will have broadband service. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's something maybe we can look at too, Sandra Bray. Um, hi, Holly. It's good to see you. Um, I have a quick question. So for the people you serve, I'm guessing that you're um, vendor neutral. It doesn't matter what uh, you're not steering people to anyone. You're just laying out options for what's available where they are. Is that correct? Well, this whole enterprise is really set up to be supportive of CUDs. Yeah. So, um, it is definitely the case that if you're a low income person who qualifies for assistance and you go to your caseworker and you live in Chittenden County, yeah. I'm not going to be your helper. Okay. Um, yeah. But um, are but, you. But that's not, to say, that's not to say there couldn't be a long term plan, but that's not where we're focused today. Okay. Um, well, no, it's not a criticism. I just didn't know what your territory so are you the territory you're planning to serve is the territory where cuds either exist or are building into is that correct that is correct and okay. we're starting with the 31 towns that are either served or to be served by ec fiber they currently have 5500 customers and uh, they are growing like mad and have uh added an additional eight towns just in 2020. Okay. Um, do, are there counterparts to what you're doing for the other CUDs that I think like five CUDs have formed in the last 12 months or something like that? So are you, are there counterparts there or are you? So the marvelous, the marvelous FX Flynn, who is the chair of EC Fiber, he is on my board at Equal Access to Broadband. He is also the chair of VCUDA, the Vermont Association of CUDs. And we are building this to create a replicable model or a single source of this uh, support. Yeah. Um, okay, thank I, you. I, I have to 
I have to also say that CUDs are by and large just looking at their build plans right now and trying to get that baseline, like where's the design going to come from? And so they're not close to needing a subsidy program quite yet. Okay, well, I remember a long time ago, Steve Jobs said, you know, computers should be no more complicated than your toaster. I don't, <laughs> I don't know that we ever got there. And when I look, you know, at this, our own group, the Senate getting together, although we have people, we struggle regularly with different aspects of it. So I think we're all sensitive to the fact that it's, it ain't easy to get connected. And, and to Senator Cummings' point, it really isn't easy if you're really worried about how you're going to afford your medicine and your food. Thank you. Yeah. I, I'm going to put a little pitch in while I'm here as former general counsel of the Vermont Telecom Authority. I haven't seen, I, I'm not privy to what the grant language is for all this new fiber that's being built out, but I would certainly hope that um, those recipients of, of funding are obligated to make that open architecture fiber so that other, uh, fi other providers can be accessing that fiber as well. I know it's complicated, but it just seems like um, it's something that needs to be at least talked about. So I hope the committee will think about that. That I think is one of the things we missed in the rush to get fiber out the door, but it is definitely, as we move forward now at a more manageable pace, um, something we're gonna be talking about is what, are, if you're getting state money or tax money, what are your obligations? You know, if you sell and you're a not-for-profit now, if, yeah, um, is it open access and see where we go? Okay, other questions? If not, Senator Bray, my father who fixed everything, the only thing he ever declared was not meant to be fixed was a toaster a toaster <laughs> so they are apparently not that simple <laughs> okay let me find my agenda yeah and thank you holly that that was very refreshing yeah madam chair that toaster analogy maybe was more clever than we knew because Apple does want you to replace their products on a sure regular do. cycle. Maybe they don't want you fixing your toaster after all. No, <laughs> cheaper to buy one, he decided. Okay, that gets us to Stephanie Lee. And Stephanie, thank you for hanging in there with us. No problem. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, members of the committee. Um, first of all, I'm Stephanie Lee. I'm from Verizon and I lead government affairs and public policy in the New England region. I also have one of my colleagues listening in, Ellen Cummings, who is going to be partnering. Wondering with who my cousin was down yeah. there. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That is my <laughs> colleague. Um, and she's going to be also um, partnering with me. And we also work more closely with Chris Rice, who is our lobbyist on the ground um, and has worked with us for many years. So we do appreciate the opportunity to highlight some of our work in Vermont and to talk about this issue, um, which is really important. Um, I think the pandemic, we always knew that um, access to broadband was an issue, but I think the pandemic really shed a light on a lot of the disparities and how important it really is, especially as we're all trying to work from home, stay connected, even have more telehealth appointments and our kids, every kid um, needs to be able to have access to education remotely. And that was the first area um, back in March when schools were closed that um, schools were panicking. They were reaching out, they knew they had to go remote. They didn't know how they were going to do it. It was happening in cities as well as in rural areas where um, departments of education and um, leaders of schools are saying, how are we gonna reach our, our kids? 
They don't all have connectivity. They don't know how to use connectivity. And we looked at it similar to what Holly was talking about, which was really, um, she was an excellent speaker, Holly. That, that was great. Um, but she's right. It's, it's about affordability. It's about access. And then it's about adoption. Not e even if you you can you have the money or you're given the money to buy the access, and you have a provider running right by your house. Not everybody knows how to actually use the technology. So Verizon is looking at that um, access from all of those areas. So I wanted to just sort of fast forward a little bit of a, a few things we did during the pandemic, and that we hope to carry through um, what we learned as we continue to move forward. Well, obviously rural broadband or lack thereof of rural broadband is a, is a real issue. And um, one of the things Verizon has been doing is um, more aggressively building out our 4G LTE network, um, eventually a 5G network. Um, in Vermont itself over the past three years, we've invested about $40 million. Um, corporately, we invest um, last year in the pandemic, we actually decided to invest more than we originally told Wall Street we were going to invest. So we were supposed to invest about 17 to 17.5. We invested over 18 billion. And we are going to invest at that same clip again in 2021 um, with a focus on really trying to add capacity where we need it, but also expanding coverage um, as well, which is critical. At the beginning, again, when school districts started coming to us, um, trying to figure out how they're gonna reach their kids, one of the things we knew um, was really important is that we were able to get technology into kids' hands. So we very quickly started to work with departments of education um, across the country. Um, we came up with a remote, a discounted remote learning plan that we could actually work with school districts on it was a bulk thing that we we put together there on a literally we, we pivoted very quickly um, and now we have 40 states that are participating and more than representing over 38 million students um, in vermont um, this discounted program what it was is that we worked with the departments of education and the school districts where they could actually get hotspots jet packs um, and 4g lte data plans into the hands of students wherever they might be located where service was available. Um, in Vermont, there are about 1,500 students um, that have benefited from one of these HUTS jetpacks and the 4G LTE wireless plans. It's throughout the state. Um, there's some, some districts that um, participated a little bit more strongly where they probably had more students that didn't have access. So I know other providers were doing similar things, but that was a way we thought we could help. And we're looking, we're extending those deep discounts. They're about 75% discounted rates that the schools, some of them use Care Act's money, some of them found other funds um, to help their families. And we're extending that pricing through the end of 2021 and are looking at more sustainable options so that districts can help fill that gap um, if we're gonna be in a remote environment or a hybrid environment in the long term. The other thing we did through our corporate social responsibility, Verizon has a program where we work with Title I schools called Verizon Innovative Learning. And we work with about 260 um, middle school and high schools across the country. And we're adding another 150 this year. And we provide them professional development, work with the teachers, but we also provide free internet access and STEM education tools. Um, when the pandemic hit, we went to all the schools that we we're working with, including our alumni, and offered them to have, we gave them 4G LTE plans, at least for the school year in the emergency situation. Um, there were two middle schools in Burlington, Vermont, that are part of that innovative learning network, where we also made that offer to them as well. Um, we also discounted our pricing for our unlimited pricing plans for adding healthcare workers and teachers to a program that we have um, offered to first responders and active duty military and veterans. And now permanently um, healthcare workers, teachers and their families um, are able to have the best pricing that we have available for our consumers. We also took participate in the Keep America Connected pledge to ensure that our customers 
um, could stay connected during the pandemic where they were not charged, we would not terminate service or charge late fees. We extended that um, beyond the pledge for an additional few months. And now um, we're working with our customers, putting them on payment plans and doing everything to ensure if they're still struggling with the pandemic that we keep them connected. The other thing we're doing is looking at this picture um, going forward. This, um, we realize that wireless can fill in gaps. We're not everything for everybody, but because of the mobility, um, it does provide opportunity as it did for some of these school, schools that had need. But one of the things we're doing is um, really looking and working with the federal government on really trying to um, build subsidies, subsidies so that families beyond lifeline subsidies um, that, that others have talked about, which we offer for wireline products in our wireline footprint, um, but have subsidies that people can use no matter what their technology is. That would be uh, you know, like an EBT card where they get 20 to $50 a month to be able to discount products. Um, I know Congress did take some steps as part of the emergency broadband benefit package and we're hoping that we can work with them as an industry to do some things more permanently. So um, Verizon is, you know, we realize the digital divide is something that we need to work on. We continue to invest um, in our own networks and we're also lobbying at all levels to come up with um, different types of um, government funded subsidies so that there can be more public private partnerships in unserved areas. Um, including especially rural areas where there just isn't a lot of option or any option. So that, that's pretty much where Verizon is on this. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, questions from the committee. Not up, Senator Sorotkin. Um, so it sounds to me like we're, we've got a subsidy program in place through March at this point uh, with general fund dollars um, at $40 a month, which is continuing the program that the CARES funding established through December. But in March, we're gonna get a $50 subsidy from the federal government for a different population, a low income population versus a population in need because of they have telehealth or tele, tele-education or job needs. Um, do you see a, a need for something else to continue uh, some sort of assistance to the people who are getting it now? Yes, well, we, we think it, similar to a lifeline type service that um, which only goes so far um, right as you know it, it's about a 995 a month discount it, you know so that it's that ten dollar a month discount although Verizon and our wireline is doubling it right now to twenty dollars we'd like to see a subsidy for people that fit the need that they can always get the subsidy because so that they won't be left behind because I think as our society evolves and we're see, seeing it really in this um, pandemic, we're really leaving whole entire portions of our society behind and um, that's not good for their, their own livelihoods as well as our, our communities and our um, economic development. But as I understand it, what the federal government is doing is giving a much larger subsidy to those same people for broadband. Yes. Yes, and that is, and that's really just specific to emergency relief at this point. We're looking to work with the federal government on a more sustainable, a long-term sustainable program. Well, <laughs> we would like to do that as well, but we're, but I'm focusing on the immediate future. Yes. I guess I'm asking about the three thousand people that are on. There may be some overlap, but there's three thousand people on the broadband. And forgive me, Senator McDonald. <laughs> People on the broadband on the, broad, on the broadband uh, subsidy program right now. Oh, so you're talking about house. people? How many in a household? You know, supposed to three, you're right. Four more, than, more more than three thousand people. Three thousand units. Three thousand households um, are now getting help based upon their specific needs of telemedicine or education. Uh, does Verizon have a position on continuing that program during the pandemic? 
We, we are supportive of it, but obviously, you know, it's not our decision, but we are um, really talking to um, our federal leaders about making sure that people that need access and have affordability, um, that they have the resources that they need to stay connected. Thank you. I'm not seeing any. Um, before we go on to Owen Smith, who has been with us through thick and thin. Roger Nishi had one thing he wanted to add that he had forgotten. So, Roger, I see your name. Are you there? Mm, back. You're back. Okay. You had one thing you wanted to add here. Sure. I neglected to mention that TDS Telecom, which is Northfield, Ludlow, and Perkinsville, they implemented a program called uh, TDS Connect, and it provided uh, broadband 25 over five for 1995 a, a month for tw a 12 month period. And that included free, um, Wi Fi with that. And it, it followed really the national program for Lifeline, in which you had to qualify either through Medicaid, food stamps, uh, supplemental security income, the federal housing assistance program, veterans pension and the National School Lunch Program. So they did implement that. And uh, I don't have the numbers on that, but I, I can request those if you would like to hear those at some point. That would be helpful. Thank you and thank them. Okay, any questions? Not seeing any. Owen, oh, thank you for sticking with us till the bitter end. Um, the floor is yours, but we're probably exhausted, so you should get a free ride. Okay. Um, and I could also say uh, ditto with what Verizon said, we could all go home for the weekend, right? <clears throat> uh, you could try that, but I know if you get away with it. <laughs> no, um, Madam Chair, thank you very much for the, uh, the invitation to be here uh, this afternoon, and, and good to see all of the, the other committee members. Um, thank you as well for the opportunity. My name is Owen Smith. I am with uh, AT&T. Uh, I cover Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont for uh, legislative and uh, external affairs. <clears throat> so um, I would like to highlight what we've done in 2020 during this pandemic, which is, has really been the, the crux of our uh, efforts um, along with the affordability piece. But um, as many of you know, or all of you know that, that uh, uh, FirstNet is a big piece of our build out in Vermont and across the country. It's allowed us to do some things that we uh, didn't really have from a, uh, a business practice um, that, that made, a, made a whole lot of sense. But um, over the last couple of years, we've made some very uh, big headways into uh, networking. Um, and uh, I'd just like to cover a, a little bit of that. Um, and I, I will say that uh, the first net network, which is for public safety, benefits our commercial customers, the AT&T commercial customers across the state and the nation as well. So, um, so despite the, um, the huge increases in our network, which I think we've all experienced, um, Wi-Fi calling up 105%, video and, video and web conferencing up 400%, text messaging up 120%, um, our networks have held out very strongly, and I think that's a testament to what we've done um, over the last four or five years uh, in Vermont. Um, from 2015 on through um, the end of 2019, um, AT&T invested $100 million into our Vermont network. And uh, uh, again, back to FirstNet over the last 18 months, um, it's going very well. We're um, more than halfway to our goal of 30 sites over the first five years, and we're just about three years out of the five years into it. Um, we've got 18 sites on air. 15 of those came on uh, in, in 2020. Um, in, in addition to those AT&T built sites, um, we also contracted out to Great Northwoods Wireless up in Essex County. They've turned on the six committed sites uh, that... Uh, that they have um, committed to uh, in 2020. So um, those sites in Lunenburg, Norton, um, Averill, Wenlock, Cannon, and Warren Gore. So we continue to make um, some great strides with FirstNet, and these are cell sites that provide uh, anywhere from 
a mile worth of coverage or uh, 20 miles worth of coverage, depending on the, on the terrain. Um, and, and of course, we all know that Vermont is a tough state to cover with, with a uh, line of sight wireless uh, network. The other thing we've done is we've also upgraded many of our sites. In fact, sites in 77 towns in Vermont have been upgraded, um, uh, adding capacity using that first net spectrum. So that's really added a lot of capacity for people to use too as they work in, in uh, school from home. So um, one other thing that we did with the network in 2020, we um, uh, got a, a, a roaming agreement with a, uh, a local provider in the state uh, and we're able to get on 62 of, of their sites uh, that were underutilized and are providing um, coverage in uh, 52 or more towns across the state. Um, that, was, that is now available to AT&T subscribers. Um, so that in itself has really expanded our network uh, by um, 28 to, to 32% um, within the state with those added uh, cell sites. So uh, we've, we've added uh, nearly 90 cell sites in 2020 um, to our Vermont network, which also um, already had over 250 sites. So uh, we're, we're really pleased with that. Um, on the affordability front, um, you've heard a lot about the Keep America Connected pledge. Um, AT&T was obviously a big part of that. Um, that has run out, but we uh, continue to provide assistance uh, along those lines with uh, service terminations, late fees, overages, and so forth. Um, so um, uh, uh, I think it's indicative. Um, we know that our customer outreach along these lines has been working. Um, the percentage of customers that are, that are behind their, their payments is in line with levels uh, that were before COVID. So um, we continue to, to work with our customers and encourage our customers to, to uh, work with us on putting in payment plans and, and working out um, if they're having dif difficulties uh, related to COVID. Um, you know, similar to uh, Verizon, we, we've done uh, a lot of adjustments of our offers and, and rates and features, uh, a lot to our unlimited plans uh, to give people uh, more access and, and uh, more data. Um, we've also worked with school districts in Vermont and across the country, similar to, to what Verizon has stated, what Stephanie has, has stated. Um, so we've got uh, wireless plans uh, for teachers and families, um, first responders, military personnel, doctors, nurses, veterans, uh, all eligible for an extra 25% savings off of our regular wireless plan. So uh, that's a big piece of our um, uh, offering. Yesterday, we, we announced a new unlimited data offer for public education. It includes unlimited data um, for free um, with a free wireless hotspot. Um, or through your own device as well. Um, so so uh, it can be as low as $12 per student. Um, and in some cases, there's no cost to teachers. So again, a real focus on trying to uh, connect with um, education and students and teachers. So we've got aggressive pricing on, on uh, uh, devices, including the new um, iPhone 12, 30% uh, off accessories, and uh, you know, go, goes on and on and on. Um, we have, Holly had mentioned um, uh, seniors and digital literacy. Um, back last summer, uh, we locally AT&T um, partnered with the Vermont Agency on Aging and we put together um, a video and, and did some live Zoom digital uh, literacy programs with the agency and um, uh, a lot of their facilities across the state. We, we actually made a video and have made that available for the uh, agency on aging to, to put around to uh, many senior, set and senior um, centers across the uh, state of Vermont. Um, so along with that, just more on the national piece, we've uh, started a $10 million uh, distance learning and family connection fund. Um, we've given a hundred, uh, excuse me, a million dollars to the con agency to expand online learning resources that will also help trickle into Vermont, um, a half a million dollar contribution to a, uh, a video uh, calling application called uh, Caribou, um, allows family members to read and draw and play games um, remotely with, with one another. So 
Um, again, we're, we're very thrilled with what we've done and what we've been able to do. The timing has been um, uh, great with COVID and, and I think many um, residents in the state of Vermont have benefited from the network uh, buildup that we've been doing for the last two or three years. Thank and I think you. that does it. Any questions? About 142. What was that the answer to? This isn't Jeopardy. How many questions I have? Oh. <laughs> okay. Would you like to ask one? I, Madam, Madam Chair, we're, we, we sit here and we listen to statistics and vocabulary and percentages of discounts and how many iPhone numbers, this, that, and the next thing, whether they're new or they're used. And when I'm done, I don't know anything more than when the presentation began other than my own frustration with not understanding what witnesses are talking about. Okay. Which is probably a personal failing, Mr. Madam Chair. Well, one I think you probably share with more than one of us. Um, Owen. Can you tell us how many people you signed, you know, new customers you took on as part of the COVID? I can tell you that nationally because we just released that for um, the fourth quarter. Um, and it was very similar to um, what we did in the third quarter, um, about 1.9 million new subscribers. Um, I do not have that number for Vermont. I can try to get that for you. I do not have that now. That would be helpful. How many people expanded their service um, using some of the incentive programs? How many came on at the beginning of the pandemic and how many of them are still on? Okay, if you can find that, that would be helpful. Senator Hardy has a question. We, we have um, that six month period uh, was the biggest increase in our net additions since 2011. So we know it's significant. Um, and I will see if I can find that for Vermont. Okay, Senator Hardy, you have a question. Okay, so this is a, just trying to understand the technology and you know get the hip language to go along with it but the for AT&T and Verizon you are cell phone and Stephanie's not here anymore but you're cell phone carriers so when you're talking about building out in Vermont you're not talking about what the other people who've testified like Roger who's amazingly still with us, um, <laughs> um, which is laying the fiber, doing the, you know, fiber to prem stuff. You're talking about building cell phone towers and uh, wireless technology, right? So it's a different build out. It's a different infrastructure. Is that right? <laughs> correct. No, that's, that's, it's wireless broadband. Um, so you are correct. We do utilize the, uh, the fiber that, that these uh, wonderful companies are, are laying throughout the state. Um, but we are basically transmitting a wireless signal, um, a broadband signal. It, it exceeds the 25.4. Um, you know, we've got speed tests as high as 70 or 80 or 90 megabytes, uh, you know, uh, downloaded and uh, 15 or 20 uploads. Um, or, or higher. So it is broadband, but it's wireless broadband, correct? Okay. So it's wireless. It's like what I get on my cell phone and that I can sometimes use on my laptop, but it's, it's not a, a, it's not a copper cable or a fiber cable that's coming to my front door. It's coming wirelessly, right? I know I sound silly, but that's, I'm just trying to understand the difference between the technologies. You're absolutely right. Okay. Okay. So, um, but you're, you answered my second question, which was, so your sort of equivalent to the upload download is 
you said you can get as high as 70 up and did you say 25 down? Yeah, and, and that's that's exactly. Um, so that's on our 4G uh, LTE. Um, it will be uh, faster than that when we roll out 5G, but uh, that's what we're um, experiencing today. And uh, it has all to do with how far you are from the tower, how many other people are, are uh, in your area working off the same signal, but very realistic uh, numbers for the wireless industry. Okay, and then the prod last question, and then Senator Bray, I see has questions, but um, the the project or the build out that you noted in um, Essex County, which is one of our most remote counties in the state, that was because you either built or leased a tower up there. Is that true? So that is true. That is through uh, FirstNet, which is the, the federal authority for public safety to contract that AT&T won three years ago and we've been building out in Vermont and other places. So AT&T is building 30 sites and this is just in the first five years. We also went to a company called Great North with Wireless who we work with in New Hampshire and in Maine and asked them to build six additional sites up in Essex County, which, which they have done and have completed um, as of November of this year. So those six sites are up and running. Okay. With voice um, and uh, 4G LTE. D which is data, right? The, the 4G is yeah. voice yeah. and data. Yeah. Okay. Um, and yeah, I know you have plans for more. There's one in, in Senator Bray and I's, my district that's being proposed right now. So anyway, I'm just wanting to try to distinguish between the types of technology. Thank you. I think I hear people going back and forth between megabits per second and megabytes per second. And I thought all these measurements were in megabits per second. Am I missing something? It's one, one and the same. Well, a bit and a byte are not the same. One is eight times as big as the other. So that's what I'm trying to keep straight. I always thought the measurements were megabits per second. Okay. Okay. It's Friday afternoon. I think we're all fried. Um, it's been a long week. Thank you, uh, all our witnesses, for hanging in there with us. And we will uh, continue this discussion. We're still trying to get a handle on where the need is, um, how expensive it's going to be to fill that need. Um, we've got Holly's getting people to understand how broadband is important and how you get people signed up. But then there's how we pay for keeping them signed up. So um, we will continue this discussion. Thank you, everyone. Um, I believe Faith has posted the um, agenda for next week. Again, if anybody has anything they want on the agenda, let me know. Um, it's 3.49, so Faith is still with us. Um, so unless there's any other discussion I'm going to sign us off. Have a good weekend. Don't look at your computer screens until Monday or Tuesday. And um, I'll see everybody next week. Uh, Senator Cummings? Yes. Senator Cummings, can you hang for a minute after we go off the air? Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you for your time Thank today. Thank you all. Ending